Welcome back. Well, earlier we told you how Democrats fought to shape the political battlefield in primaries across eight states. On Tuesday, it was one of the biggest primary nights of the midterm elections. And as Arise America correspondent Sherry Richardson reports, a lot of eyes were on California. That's where the race for governor and several competitive House races have made the state hotly contested territory. And where we invest in children, Jeff Sessions, invest in children where we don't tear them from the loving arms of their mothers and their fathers. We don't do that. Where we fuel the greatest economic engine the world has ever known, at the same time we're protecting our environment and protecting our workers. That's California. I just talked to Gavin Newsom, but let me just take a moment to send him another message. Mr. Mr. Newsom, Mr. Newsom made it clear that he wanted to, to run against me instead of another Democrat. Well, as I told him in San Jose at the debate, be careful, Mr. Newsom, be careful for what you wish for. Cox faces long odds in the Golden State, which leans liberal, and where Republicans are increasingly marginalized in state politics. The governor's race is one of hundreds of contests across California that could solidify Democratic dominance in Congress. Democrats need to pick up a total of 23 seats in November in order to take back control of the House of Representatives. Tuesday also saw a record number of 122 women running for office in the eight states where primaries were held. That includes the state of New Mexico, where Democrat Deborah Holland won the party's nomination for a congressional seat. She could make history if she wins in November to become the nation's first Native American congresswoman. So tonight we made history. Our win is a victory for working people, a victory for women. Political science professor Sanford Schramm explains why he thinks so many women are vying for political seats. It's an unprecedented number. It's part of this larger resistance that began as early as the day after the inauguration, where a lot of women are outraged by Trump's behavior and the policies that he stands for and has now enacted uh, that are very anti-women. And there are women running at all levels of government and bringing in a lot of fresh blood, younger people, uh, people of color, Native Americans, as well as Latinos and African Americans but also Asian Americans as well and uh, these women could radically change Congress in particular if they get elected. In Iowa, 28-year-old state legislator Abby Finkenhauer won one of the state's Democratic congressional primaries up for grabs. She is fighting to be the youngest woman ever elected to the U.S. House. I'm Sherry Richardson for Arise America. Uh, uh, to assess those uh, primary results. Let's now talk to the political strategist Christopher Metzler, who is in Washington. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Mr. Metzler. Uh, yesterday, of course, being called one of the most important days of the primary season. Explain why that is and what is at stake. Sure. Uh, last night was really the opportunity. Keep in mind that in the midterm elections, uh, what's happening is that the Democrats are looking to retake control of the House and the Senate. They believe fundamentally that they have a better chance of taking control of the House. Last night's election, uh, particularly, let's look at the state of California, was designed to try to get as many seats as possible, as many candidates as possible, uh, to challenge Republicans 
come the fall of this year. You also had in uh, Montana, what you had was the nomination of uh, someone to go against uh, current Senator John Tester, uh, who is considered one of the most vulnerable uh, Democrats from the Senate standpoint. You also had a number of women, both uh, Republicans and Democrats across the country, winning various roles. So this sets the stage for what is going to be uh, the midterm elections and also at the state level sets the stage for governorships. Uh, governorships are extremely important because in most cases they control the political machines of the state. In the United States we do what we call redistricting and drawing the redistricting map. Uh, and so if you are the party in power, you want to be able to have uh, governors that can move this through the political spectrum. So this is really just a preview of the race to come in the fall of this year. And in your opinion, um, going forward, what strategy should the Democrats, for instance, now adopt? Well, first of all, the Democrats are known politically uh, in the United States for snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, in this case, what we have is that Democrats simply don't have a message. The message that Democrats have adopted is uh, we don't like Trump, Trump is a bad guy, day after day after day, we have no plan but eh, uh, Trump's still a bad guy. Uh, here's the problem with that. The problem with that if, is as Americans are looking at uh, the lowest unemployment rates, as they're looking at how the economy is doing overall, uh, the we hate Trump, Trump is not a message, uh, it, that, that's gonna work. And, and, and in fact, uh, Democrats need to move away from all of this talk of impeachment. If that's the strategy that they're going to take, Republicans are very happy uh, that they're going to do that. Uh, because if they continue with this impeachment message, you have a number of people who are saying, wait a minute, you're trying to take away our duly elected uh, president and we're kind of happy with what it is that, that he's doing. So for Democrats, there needs to be a message. It needs to make sense. Uh, it cannot be a message that comes strictly from talking points are from inside Washington, it has to deal with what they are going to do for the American people. If they're unable to do that, there is no hope for them uh, to move forward. Well, that's a very interesting, very thorough analysis there. Just uh, tell us perhaps how you would describe the current political climate in the U.S. Do you get the sense that Americans are more involved than ever before or less involved? Much more involved. And here's uh, what I attribute that to. Number one, traditional media or legacy media uh, really isn't where a lot of Americans get our news anymore. Uh, so you've got the major networks, okay, great, fine. Uh, however, the, con the, the folks who are consuming news are now doing it from social media, from various platforms, digitally, that kind of stuff. And so there is, in fact, a much more involved uh, American electorate. They want to know how this election that's coming up in the midterms will impact their everyday lives. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think that you are most likely going to see an uptick in the number of folks who are going to vote uh, in the fall of this year. Americans are energized. Uh, some are maybe happy with the direction of the, of the country, others may not be. 
uh, so happy. However, they are in fact energized because they understand that elections have consequences, whatever those consequences mean to them. And so the use of social media really has expanded the way that Americans can get involved. It is no longer call your congressman's office. Well, you call the congressman's office, you leave a message, you never get a call back. Uh, there are texts, emails, social media, getting the message out. And so I think that, from a political standpoint, equals a much more involved and energized American populace. And just going back to those all-important primaries, um, all eyes, of course, seem to be on California. Just mm -hmm. remind us why and whether the results are any clearer yes. now in the key races there. Uh, so the reason is because California has uh, what, at, at the time, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor at the time, and they tried to put into place what is being called the so-called jungle primary. So what does that mean? Uh, what it means is the top two vote-getters, uh, regardless of party, will advance to competition when it comes time for the final election. Um, here's the problem. The problem for Democrats in particular in this race was that California is supposed to be the bastion of liberalism. However, Republicans ended up with getting on the ballot, because this was a big fear of Republicans, they ended up getting on the ballot a Republican to challenge uh, the Democratic nominee for governor. That is an embarrassing piece for the Democrats. Also, in California, there's a lot of conversation about uh, California being a Democratic haven. That is not exactly accurate. And the reason it's not accurate is if we look at the number of people who are registered independents in California, they in fact are one of the largest parties in California. And Democrats, in my view, uh, should have done much better uh, in a state like California. And, and, and that's what people are looking, about, looking at. What we heard a lot of conversation before last night, this conversation about the so-called blue wave, and in the blue wave, blue is going to sweep America. Well, if blue can't sweep California, uh, how is blue going to sweep America? And that is the, the, the important thing that comes out. It is a cautionary tale for Democrats to get a message out across the country. If you can't do it in California, you're going to have a hard time doing it across the country. That's why it's so important. That's why so many people were looking to California to calibrate uh, what their strategies are going to be moving forward. Absolutely sterling analysis there, Christopher. Thank you exceedingly. Christopher Metzler, the political strategist.